Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Welcome to the next session of the probabilistic machine learning reading group. Um, tonight, we'll be going over kernel methods. And I'd like to thank uh, Pinku Dimnath, who's presenting tonight, because uh, he kind of saved us at the last minute. Our um, previously scheduled presenter had a family emergency. So thank you very much, Pinku. And you can uh, start whenever you're ready. Um, we can't hear you. Uh. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So we're going to discuss chapter 17 of the book, uh, which is kernel methods. Uh, so main idea is like pre in the previous chapters, we saw uh, like parametric models where there are some hyperparameters which we train but in the non-parametric methods like the model is based on the data set like it compares the current test set test point with the previous data set and then like gives an estimate like which like which input is closest to the output so this concept is also similar to attention that we saw in recurrent uh, in the sequence models so here like we are mapping like uh, functions which takes a data point from x into x into a real real uh, real number field so here uh, so it's kind of running a loop like a 2d loop and matching every input with every other input and here this k is the kernel and c is like uh, some sort of uh, score, like which is uh, part of the data set. Okay, now this is greater than zero. Like, like the quality of this Mercer kernel would be that this sum would be greater than or equal to zero. So this happens if this k is positive definite. Uh, this kernel, yeah, Mercer kernel. So what does it mean by positive definite? It means like, uh, like it's a property of matrix in which like. If you plot it, then the graph would always be going upwards, and there would be like uh, like it would be convex in nature. Okay, now this case usually is called the gram matrix. Yep, yeah, and this k gram matrix contains like and every like element of this gram matrix is like the value of the kernel for each of the uh, pairs of data sets. Okay, now this in each of these values like k, x, and x prime can is uh, if it is uh, in this form like exponential minus some mean and divided by some uh, bandwidth, then we call this squared exponential or exponentiated quadratic or Gaussian or RBF or radial basis function kernel. Okay, and this L is called the length scale or the bandwidth of the kernel. You kind of like the analogy here is with the normal distribution where X prime would be the mean and L would be the like a uh, standard deviation. Yeah, so the analogy here is like we are kind of scaling the value and then exponentiating. And yeah, so with that, so there are lots of slides, so we should move forward. Okay, so now this k, since it is positive definite, we can express it in this matrix form where, <laughs> so this matrix form is similar to eigen decomposition, where this delta is like the diagonal matrix containing the eigenvalues. And since we say it's positive definite, these eigenvalues would be greater than, all of them would be greater than zero. So this is a diagonal matrix. So all the diagonal elements have the eigenvalues and all rest of the, uh, elements are zero. And this U will be the matrix containing the eigenvectors. Okay, and since we are saying like uh, it's positive definite and if this is like orthonormalized, then this UT would also be the inverse of U. Yeah, we, we, it doesn't matter, but we're just keeping it in mind. Okay, now, uh, now this can be like, organized into two separate, like a multiplication of two separate 
uh, I didn't uh, separate uh, uh, matrices. If we like uh, divide this into like like if I if we represent delta like uh, eigenvalues as the multiplication of two two matrices, and since it's uh, diagonal, we can represent this matrix multiplication simply as this way as a dot product. Okay, now since we have this divided this uh, three matrices into a pair of two matrices. So we can represent each of them as a phi xi, which is this like this part. And kij would then be represented in terms of this function. And so then we can like imagine this multiplication as the inner product of these functions. So this function is going like this way, and this one is going this way, like it's uh yeah, basically can see like it's like an inner product. So Mercer's theorem is like generalizing this inner product from the kernel matrices that we saw previously here to a function. So we have this kernel of functions. We are like, like changing our view from this matrix to function space. So that's the concept of Mercer's theorem. So we'll see like, uh, we'll try to understand like, like an example. So, so we can represent this kernel. Suppose there's a kernel, which is taking a dot product or inner product and then squaring it. Since we are squaring it, we, it will always be positive. So that ensures that it's positive definite. So the symbol is the inner product. So in TD, we, uh, in two dimension, we can expand this further into this expression. And then we can, if we want to break it, break this uh, expression of three terms into a function. So we want to break this expression of three terms into two functions, multiplication of two functions. So in that case, each of the functions would be in this form. Here, this X is representing the concatenation, concatenation of X1 and X2. So what, would, what happened here is like we had a, pair of variables in 2D, but the function space is has three terms, would have three terms. So we kind of changed our scope from 2D to 3D. Like the, like the variables in Cartesian space is in 2D, but in function space, it's in 3D. Uh, there are like there are more popular Mercer kernels that we can see in this link. So we would see some of them here. So first they're like, so, so we can like categorize them into stationary kernels for real valued. So by stationary, it means like we are checking the difference. So, and we, we're not really caring about in which direction this difference is. So that's what it means by stationary. So, and this difference, difference is like element wise difference, not like, uh, like in each of the uh, like directions. So, yeah. Okay, so there is this ARD kernel. Uh, this is also stationary. This is one of the, this is also like a stationary kernel. So this is a generalized version of RPF. So basically, to we if we want to like remember RPF, we would like imagine like it's an exponential function, like uh, such as this one. So now this ARD kernel is a generalized version of RBF. So RBF uses like a, like a squared like a distance like the squared distance like what's called uh equal, some sort of distance so in ard we use mahalanobis distance which is like a generous form of that distance so and we the full form of this ard is automatic relevancy determination and yeah so here it is so this expert this is like a this there is a uh sigma 2 which sigma squared that controls the overall variance and we are exponentiating a term inside there's a minus half and there is this r t so i is usually the difference and it's in matrix form and this uh sigma inverse is usually 
covariance matrix and it's diagonal. Since it's diagonal, finding the inverse is pretty simple. Like we just like uh, divide the diagonal elements by one. So it's like, like we are like uh, flipping the diagonals. That's it. And yeah, and there's this huge formula which would take a long time to understand. And but uh, so we can understand, we, we might be hard to understand this formula later on. So we can look into it. And this LD here in this here uh, in this equation would be the characteristic length scale of dimension D. So we just uh, keep uh, remember this for to understand the later part. But this formula is pretty good. Okay, so to visualize the use of the variable that we state, like previously, characteristic length scale, it kind of controls like which dimension we want to focus in. And we, in this diagram, we can see that. So suppose we have this function space that is represented in A. So this A is, would be like a function sampled from a Gaussian process, which is, which is GP. With that previous kernel that we mentioned, if both L1 and L2, like this variable, is one, then we want to focus on both the dimensions. So in that case, this will be the output. But if uh, in B, figure B, if L1 is one and L2 is five, in that case, we are ignoring the second dimension because L2 is five. We are ignoring the second dimension. So all the sampled elements would focus mainly on the first dimension. So yeah, so the L2, L variable is kind of a way to control which dimension to focus on. So there's another kernel, which is also stationary. So it's called Matern kernel. So this is the uh, expression for that. So it's a huge function, but to break it down, this KV, where this KV is the Bessel function, like we can find this function in physics. It kind of uh, models the, like the movement of a wire if we do it like this, like if, we move, if there's a, suppose a chain and if we move it like this, then that chain would like take certain shapes uh, based on how, how frequently we are moving it. So that that is modeled by this Bessel function. And L here is like the length scale that we saw previously. It kind of controls like which dimension we focus on. And gamma is the gamma function. So this is the gamma function. Uh, since uh, V is, V can be like a real number and not necessarily an integer. So in that case, we cannot just simply replace it by a factorial. So it has to be like a function expression. <sighs> okay. and. Functions sampled from this Gaussian process are k times differentiable. If uh, v is greater than k, so this is the v, and k is something like we are predefining it. And if v goes to infinity, then this approaches uh, AC kernel. So what's the difference between this and the SE kernel, the RBF kernel that we saw previously. So RBF kernel kind of represents a smooth function. And, but our data set could have some sort of uh, localized uh, peaks. And globally, it might seem like smooth function, but if we zoom in, then there could be some peaks. So to represent those peaks, we can like use matern kernels. And these peaks are represented by this K times difference table. So suppose uh, K is two. So if we take to like double differentiation, then the function might still be smooth. But if we take another differentiation, then the function might not be smooth. So in those situations, we can represent by this matter and kernel. So this, so yeah, so that's what it is. Uh, rough functions can be modeled by local wiggles and as opposed to smooth squared uh, acid kernels, uh, which is smooth all in, in no matter how many differentiations we take. So yeah, so these expressions that we can find in book, this is, this is called this name. And this function can also be used as to represent velocity of a particle undergoing Brownian motion. Uh, so yeah, so what that we said, like it's continuous, but it's not differentiated. 
So it's an example of what we can represent with this function. So A represents a matron kernel with V five by two. Yes, yeah, so as we said, V can be real number. So that's why it can be fractions. So here it is. So since it's five by two, it's it we could say like it's double differentiable. And since it's V and for figure B, V is equal to half. And it's just a single differentiable. We cannot differentiate like two times. So that's why it's more wiggly here. And it is a bit smoother here. So yeah, that's it. Okay, now the stationary kernel is pretty kernels. Okay, there are lots of stuff we have to go fast. So periodic kernels kind of represents those cosine and sine functions. So this is the expression and the period of the function is represented by P. Uh, so yeah, so there's the cos cosine kernel as an example of periodic kernels. So yes, this is the functions, cosine kernel and periodic kernel. Okay, now suppose we have, uh, uh, previously we have a lot of kernels, so we need to like combine them to make new kernels. So all this, all this, all these five uh, equations that are shown here are valid ways to combine them. We can like multiply the pre a previous kernel with a constant, but this constant has to be greater than zero to ensure the positive definite property that we mentioned before. And we can also multiply this kernel by a function and we, this function can be any function. Since we are multiplying this function twice from the right and from the left, it, we kind of ensure that it would be positive definite. So it's similar to squaring a variable. So if we square a variable, then it's always positive. So the same property is used here. Okay, we can also like uh, map the kernel by another function. So and this function would have a non-negative coefficient. So this non-negative coefficient again ensures that it's positive definite. So yeah, that's it. And so since it's its requirement is only non-negative coefficient, we could expect that this function might not be always monotonous. So this function could like de in decrease for no, no, sorry, decrease and then increase. So it could be like decreasing and then increasing. So it might not always maintain the monotonous property. And yeah, so here, here we, we could also exponentiate any kernels, so it would still be a kernel. And also we could like express it in terms of matrix multiplication. Okay, so here there we, are, we can see an example of uh, where the kernel is like just a multiplication of the variables. So we could say like it's squaring it. So we can like square this function by another variable m. So suppose this m is two, in that case, we can like expand it. So after expanding it, so yeah, we, we can expand it like this. But so in that case, it kind of has uh, three terms, but if we want more granular expression, then we could use a, you could also insert a variable constant c. In that case, that c would, you, that c would like act as a pivot to, like express all the other combinations of variables that might be possible. Okay, so again, so this function that we, yeah, so wait, where am I? Yeah, so here's another example of the like those combining combining very uh, kernels so here we can see a gaussian kernel and yeah okay sorry sorry so we can use this example patterns like combination of variables to prove that a gaussian kernel is also a merson kernel so here we can see this gaussian kernel ex uh, expanded and then we can express somehow into the second line yeah, and then second line kind of proves somehow that it's cause okay, like Merson kernel is very complicated. I don't know. So yeah, and then we can combine also combine kernels by addition and multiplication. Previously we saw like combining with functions. So here we'll just use the additions and multiplication, but there's different scenarios scenarios that can be used to represent by this for each of these operators. So we can multiply two positive definite kernels together 
if we want if we want like a conjunction of the individual properties of each of the kernels and we can multiply if we want the disjunction of the individual properties so we can we can imagine this as like set operations we could have like an union offset or a or a disjunction offset so here yeah so here's the figure that tries to represent that so here we could say like the previous or uh, the top figure kind of represents the multiplications and the bottom figure the additions so we can like see the wait so here like this one is more i mean this is a figure like but yeah we can this is completed again i don't know so again here kernels for structured input so like we can use kernels for by structured input what is structured inputs structured inputs are those that have some sort of structures like strings and graphs which which are not pretty random so we can use these structures to like uh, understand further like infer further knowledge about the inputs so kernels are useful for uh, for mapping structured objects but hard to featureize variable sized kernels now hard to feature as variable sized kernels okay now suppose strings can we can have variable length but the kernels has to be like fixed so that's what it means so a string kernel comparing strings in terms of the number of angles they have in common okay so kernels yeah so that's basically what's saying like uh the previous models that we saw it can cannot represent structured inputs but kernels are pretty good at it so we can also use kernels to represent random walk kernel which is a kernel on graphs that performs random walks on two graphs simultaneously and counts the number of paths produced by both walks okay so previously we mentioned like gp which represents gaussian processes so what gaussian processes is like an assumption that like a st stochastic process uh, which contains a number of random variables and any combination of these random variables kind of uh, has a normal distribution associated with it so that's what it means so it kind of like another concept like the addition of any random variable kind of represents a normal distribution so it's like a generalization of that like concept so so that's what it says distribution over function functions and distribution this is kind of uh, represents a like an addition of over distribution of functions and these functions maps a variable space to a real valid space so real valid number so the assumption is like function values at a set of m inputs uh, where m so where f is like an concatenation of the function values at different expositions is jointly Gaussian. Uh, by Gaussian, it means like a normal distribution with, with mean as shown and covariance matrix as shown there. Okay, so here, uh, when we are like uh, sampling sampling inputs for the model we can we can assume that there are no, no noise so if there are no noise then there's no term for the error terms in the expression so here the yn would be just directly f xn but we won't be considering in any error so gp in this case acts like an interpolator of training data so here, yeah, that's it. And in that case, the second equation represents like a like a combined joint distribution of a test variable given all the input variables. So yeah, basically that. And here mu x is like the mean of the training set that we know. And mu star is the mean of the test variables that we have seen so far and k axis and all those others are like the covariant matrices for different combinations of training data and test data and given this joint distribution the posterior distribution that results from this is results from conditioning these gaussians is shown in the 
third equation and fx here x like a prior distribution so this fx as in this fx so fx in here would act as a prior distribution controlling like the direction of the final posterior and the predictive uncertainty increases as we move further away from the absolute data so what basically means like uh, if the test data is further away from any of the inputs seen so far then uh, my prediction would be like erroneous so that's what it means here yeah so basically that and the mean that we mentioned previously it can be expressed in this complex equation which is hard to understand but the but we can like see like a part here so this part kind of represents like uh normalizations where we are deducting the mean of the train data from the function and then scaling it by the covariance matrix and similarly for the for calculating the covariance matrix of the test data by which is represented by the star we can see this function by this the deducting part kind of uh, it kind of is similar to a projection projecting kx onto like kx star onto the covariant matrix of the input data yeah okay we are seeing noisy observations again and he, suppose it's an example like it's trying to show an example suppose why oh sorry previously we saw noise free observations so usually what happens like there are noise in the observations of the test uh, a training set in that case that noise is represented by this en and this we assume that this en is normally distributed uh sorry which okay so in that case the covariant matrix would be the covariant matrix of the input plus the covariance matrix of the uh, noise so this is this and yeah so that's that so in that case this delta this delta that is associated for the error term is analogous to the indicator function if it is discrete or direct delta function if it is continuous now the model must come close to the observed data but it doesn't necessarily has to be like exactly matching the observed data okay so this covariant matrix further can be represented like that okay and again in that case like previously this joint distribution that we saw here so for the error case it would be like this one and similarly the posterior predictive density uh, which is similar to the previous slide and here we are seeing like a further explanation which is hard to understand with the mean okay so so we have this function that is expanded further and we have this okay now if we assume that the mean is zero like mu, mu star and mu x are zero in that case this function simplifies to the last equation and this last equation is identical to the kernel risk regression that we saw in previous chapters like the last chapter okay so now we want to compare like uh, this the current kernel approach to the kernel regression that we saw in previous chapter so kernel regression is like a generative process uh, to regression in which we approximate the probabilities using kernel density function uh, Gaussian processes uses positive definite kernel instead of a density kernel. So unlike density kernels, kernel uh, Mercer kernels can be defined on structured inputs. And unlike kernel regression, GP is interpolator. So by interpolator, it means like it tries to exactly match the input, whereas regression like kind of generalizes uh, with respect to all the other inputs. So Gaussian process is a Bayesian method, which allows maximizing the marginal likelihood for estimating the hyperparameters and kernel regression. We must use cross-validation to estimate the kernel parameters. Like it doesn't matter, it's not that important. Okay, and the important part here is like computation. So it takes like ON3 for calculate for like 
like uh, training docent processes and ON for kernel regression. So the main reason for taking ON cube is because we need to invert a matrix. So that takes like ON cube time. So this is the problem because if data sets are huge, then this would take like forever to train. So now, like we saw that uh, we can like represent a kernel both in terms of a matrix space and function space. So, so the matrix space could be represented as weight space and, and the function in function space. So that's what this slide describes. So suppose we have a li linear regression model like y equal to fx plus e. In that case, fx would be would be can be expressed in like the second term with a Gaussian prior. Now, in that case, the posterior distribution would be the first equation that is displayed in the middle, where phi would be the n by d design matrix. Like this, is pretty complicated. It's impossible to understand in short period of time. So then there's the a that in the second line, and p is the in the last equation. That's the posterior predictive distribution for f star. And this views the problem of inference and prediction in weight space. We we'll just assume whatever is said. Like it's hard to understand what they actually mean. So can this? So yeah. So there's lots of equations. It's pretty hard. But the insight here is like this. It kind of uses matrix inversion lemma from linear algebra. Like if you ever want to derive them, but it's pretty hard. So what happens here is like it matches the result of the noisy observation, assuming, so if we do all these steps and then like reach the last equation, this last equation is similar to the results from the noisy observation that we saw previously, if we set mean to zero. So thus we can derive a Gaussian process from a Bayesian linear regression. Like we just take it at word value. However, linear regression assumes that phi x is a finite length vector, whereas GP allows us to work directly in kernels, which may correspond to infinite length feature vector. That is, GP works in function space. So this is the important line. Like what it means, like since there's no restriction on the phi, this phi variable versus this, this phi, uh, this phi. So since there's no restriction on the design matrix, GP can effectively work in the function space, like represent any combination of variables in the function space. But if it is, it was restricted, then it would not be able to do that and would be like restricted within the weight space. Okay, let's just assume that. Okay, so there are some numerical issues with training Gaussian processes. So given this post, so these numerical issues are mainly concerned with the runtime. So here we have this posterior predictive mean, which is this. And the second term kind of represents a Cholesky decomposition of the kernel. So I guess we'd, we would need this for inverting it. So this takes O n cube time. Uh, and yeah, so this alpha is kind of a latent variable. This is represented by this equation where backslash represents back substitution. But these are related to linear algebra. Okay, so the posterior mean for each of the test case would take one time. So this is linearly dependent on the data set and calculating the variance would take n square. So we then we are so it, this can be inferred as we are checking every possible combination of the data sets within with themselves. So that's why n cube and sorry n square and yeah basically that and log marginal likelihood needed for kernel learning would be this equation. So the largest part here, the largest time takes in the decomposition, which is n cube. Okay, so estimating the kernel. So again, so given we have the kernel, we want to estimate like suppose we are performing a one d regression using Gaussian person with the RBF kernel. Uh, okay, so we may not have like uh, the computational power to calculate the kernel exactly. So we are estimating it. In that case, suppose we want to like train estimated by trial and error. So suppose we have this function and then we want to control some parameters of that Gaussian. 
sorry, kernel. In that case, we have this parameter uh, sigma squared f. This controls the vertical scale of the vertical scale, whereas this l, this this l controls the horizontal scale. Uh, okay, so most kernels have three parameters, which can have a large effect on the predictions of the model. So these parameters, we can consider them to be free parameters. Yeah, and there's also another parameter that is the sigma y squared, which is the vari variance in observation due to noise. So here's a figure to like understand what those variables meant. So here we can say that if so here L, a represents the combination where l is one uh okay so l is one and uh okay what is this l is one and sigma f is one and sigma y is 0 0.1 and b is where b is l is three and and all that you can read okay so here the difference between a and b is like a l in a is one and l in three is in l in b is three so what's the effect of that uh, okay so since l is one the bandwidth is very small and we try we want to be like very accurate so that's why it kind of maps very close to the function and since it's pretty like it doesn't have a very small window so some of the data set kind of goes out of the predictions so that's represented by this and if l is big uh, like three in that case it's more generalized and like it has a huge difference here so it kind of like it's not very specific but it kind of covers all the data set. that's what it means okay so empirical base yeah there are lots of formulas using equation to, 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 to. Uh, okay this there are a lot of formulas here so basically what would happens like if we do all those stuffs and come to this like the last equation this last equation would have a data fit term and the model complexity term and a constant so this data fit term and model complexity term kind of has an inverse relation, but in terms of the length scale L. So where's the length scale? So the length scale L is the like this L that we saw here. So what it means, like if the if we use a short length scale L, then fit would be good, but model complexity would be high. So by good fit, it means like this would be zero, and model complexity would be high. It means like this would be large. So in that case, most points would be considered <clears throat> near any other points. So using this term, yeah, so basically that. And yeah, again, this takes one cube time to run. Okay, so here it kind of shows like a demonstration of the effects of the variables that we saw earlier, like <clears throat> sigma y and sigma f and l. So here we plot the lot per genome. So what this the this uh, y axis it kind of represents the noise standard like the amount of noise. So if it is large, then there's a loss of noise. So if there is loss of noise, so the length scale wouldn't matter. That's why it's a, like a line. Okay. So so in at the top the noise is very high, so it doesn't really matter what the value of length scale is. Okay. So at the bottom when where the noise is very low in that case uh, the length scale has a huge impact and given this small noise it doesn't if the noise is small then it doesn't really matter for the function output so that's what it represents by this vertical line and this kind of represents the gray area kind of represents the confidence of the model and we can see like in b like we can see the parameter shares so given the parameters, we get a result of B and the this B represents like the, like the model is trying to map, like overfit the data set. So that's what is represented here, but here it's kind of more generalized and smooth. So the parameters for C kind of results into that graph. Okay, 
So now we'll look into Bayesian inference. Uh, so the biggest uh, advantage of using like a uh, Gaussian processes is because it's in it do is for situations where we have small number of data points. So point estimate of the kernel parameters can give poor results. But however, the point if we want a point estimate of the kernel parameters, in that case, the result of Gaussian process would be poor. So it's better to approximate the posture of our kernel parameters. So what does that mean? It means like, like uh, okay, so GP is really good for representing small number of data points. However, if we want to like try uh, to estimate kernel parameters, then it's kind of bad. So in those situations, we, then we have like an approximate solutions. So those approximate solutions are slight something Hamiltonian, all those stuff that I mentioned there. Okay, so so far we have used like Gaussian processes for uh, for predicting like the class of a variable the class of an input given the previous input so that can be said that we are classifying the data set so in that case we can to simplify like the equations for that use case we can use native lock joints so this is huge this huge expression and to calculate this expression we can use hamiltonian multi control method and both yes there's lots of stuff here and this kernel has a prior knowledge. Okay, so linear kernel are including prior knowledge of what would be That's just oh, okay, it's so much stuff. Okay, linear kernel. Okay, so here this one, this term is like an additive term, like kind of gives like associates a prior knowledge that we have about the model. So, so in that case, we have like if we, if the if there is a prior knowledge that the function would be monotonically increasing or decreasing at the like an extreme points, so that can be represented by this function. Okay, and yeah, all that. So okay, so pre like we have we know that we can use logistic regression to represent like binary classification, which is similar to the figure B, but we can also use Gaussian processes to represent the same process. But if we use the Gaussian process as it is, then the function would be like the graph would be similar to this one. So here but the problem with this representation is like at the extremes, it kind of reaches an asymptote value of some asymptote value and not necessarily zero or one. So to address that, we kind of add this, like this prior knowledge here. So that's what it does. Okay, so the advantage of using Gaussian process over a fixed model like logistic regression is that the data set could also have this nature where it could be like has this like it at the middle it kind of reaches at the bottom but at the extremes it's at the top so we may not know this like from uh, before starting training before we like start training the model so in that case if we used a logistic regression then it would have been erroneous, but if we had used Gaussian processes, then it would automatically adjust to the data set. So, so yeah, that's that. So that's the advantage of the Gaussian process. Okay, mm -hmm. now given all that, we want to like see a relationship with of Gaussian processes with uh, deep learning. So an RBF network with one hidden layer, like infinitely wide, it would be analogous to a like a Gaussian process with an with an RBN kernel, RBF kernel. So also given any neural network, we can like find a kernel that represents the inner structure of the DNN and that structure, that kernel would be called neural tangent kernel. Okay, so we saw that GP, the like the advantage of GP is to is that we can use it on small data set to get uh, accurate result. But if 
for the but if the data set is large then it would take a long time because we need to invert a matrix so we can make it like faster by addressing this inversion with the pseudo inverse so that's what it means here like approximate inverse matrix to speed of computation okay so there, there are other techniques so given so there are other techniques that kind of focuses on different aspects of that computation term so if we just use the data set as it is then it would take o and cube time but if we could map the input to a smaller latent space uh, that kind of has like a smaller number of data sets similar to encoding a word vector to a like a like similar to encoding a like a one hot encoded like representation of a word to an a uh, word vector which has more dimension so that concept we can like apply it here we can we are com we are compressing the data set to a small number of summary data set that and those summary data set is limited can be at maximum m and that m is very small to n so in that case the if we run the gp like Gaussian process on the smaller data set then it would take much smaller time so if we use this concept like this approach then this then we can refer to it as a sparse Gaussian process okay so also given the nature of Gaussian process we can also use parallelization like like GPU using GPU to compute each of the parts so so we if we want to like uh find the inverse of the matrix directly, then we could use Cholesky decomposition, but this, this method is kind of linear. So we need to finish one step first before commencing to the next step. But if we want, if we like redesign the uh, matrix into such that we can use Krylov subspace methods, then we can simply use matrix vector, uh, vector multiplications. And in that case, we can, like like use uh, use parallel computation to do this because if it is matrix vector then if we just know the matrix then we can just simply multiply the vectors instead of uh, matrix matrix multiplication in that case we need both like all the matrices together and on them in memory to do the computation so for matrix vector we can do it parallelly so this is this is simplified as a python package that package name is gpytorch okay so another method is for making the gp faster is like we can like approximate the features instead of calculating them exactly so although the power of kernels resides in the ability to avoid working with featureist representation of input such as kernel methods but it takes one cube time to invert the matrix. So we can approximate the feature map, uh, shift invariant kernels so using a randomly chosen final set of like a prior information, which is represented by M basis functions. So that reduces the runtime to a n m to plus the M cube. So M, m is the part of the basis functions that we saw. And n m is like, uh, given a data set, we are trying to compare it with the basis functions that we mentioned earlier. So the basis functions here is kind of acting as a like a base basis of a space, so a function space. So so those m basis function is kind of representing the basis of that function space, and we are mapping the data set onto that function space. So I guess this term means that. Okay. So. So we here we see an example of random features for RBF kernel. Yeah, and there are lots of equations as before, which is hard to understand. But here, this T kind of represents the like like a mean. Like if it we if we have m variables, then we divide by m. So to find a mean, so this kind of represents that because T is m slash two, and this. Uh, this this is an RT random Gaussian matrix here, and yeah, basically that. And this matrix is like sampled from like 
the sample independently from a normal distribution where sigma is the kernel bandwidth and all that and here and we can all read all the stuff which is not easy to understand yeah okay another method is first word uh, approximation so by first word it means like okay so let's just read it uh, storing the random matrix by takes like dm space and computing also takes dm space and this can be like prohibitive if the data set is huge which may need in order to get benefits of our original data sets set of features so we can like approximate that also like actual, uh, in, by using fast hammer transform to reduce memory from omd to om and yeah so it's just stating the facts okay and like previously there's a concept called ensemble modeling and uh, ensemble uh, models so, uh, so by ensemble it means like there are number of so ensemble is like uh like 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 there are like forests and forests is an ensemble method so what ensemble methods are like <clears throat> There are multiple models <clears throat> and they all make predictions and the final prediction is based on <clears throat> the combination of shit, uh, sorry. The, <clears throat> the final combination is like <clears throat> based on the uh, summary of those of those results. So this, that same concept is applied here. <clears throat> So yeah, basically that, and we are using random features for approximation and uh, yeah, like there are lots of stuff here, but the same main, main idea is like we kind of like use simpler models to make a number of predictions and we are combining those results at the end. So that's what it means, means by extreme learning machines. Okay, so finally we are into support vector machines. Okay, sorry. So support vector machines. So this is the most useful part of this uh, non-parametric models. So here support vector machines is like like it also it's like similar to attention again, like which is in fashion right now. So so what it means like we have suppose we have a data set like a number of data set, data points now all all of those data points are not necessarily important so some of them are more like more, acts more like a basis of the whole space so those basis vectors are found and given like particular weight like more importance to to those vectors and rest of the like vectors are ignored so this in like this prioritization is represented by this alpha variable. Okay, so this is like the general form of support vectors. So, but the support vector machines that we use, uh, uh, it kind of uh, tries the support vector machines that we use generally use tries to uh, maintain like a huge margin space between the variables like so that the decision boundary is large and there's less confusion like what what the class like which class a very like a data like an input belongs to so to achieve that we tend to like maximize the margin space so this like this is like an equation to derive that okay uh, this is hard to understand but if you have an image here we can try we can like it would be easier to understand so suppose we have this data set points with of two class variables and we could have like two decision boundaries one is this way or in the second diagram we could have a decision boundary like this in the first case like if you have this then there's a larger margin space and there's less confusion to which class it belongs to However, if the decision space decision boundaries like in the second diagram, then there would always be a confusion uh, with the uh, data sets 
which are close to the decision boundary. Like if it like deviates a little bit, then we we might misclassify them. So that's what it means. Okay, and the equations that we saw here, they are derived from this figure. And yeah, we can like, and like this figure is in the book, we can like see them and try to understand by ourselves. Okay, so I haven't like explored the other slides because I did not have time. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, there are lots of equations. So yeah, that's it. Okay, well, thank you very much Pingu, for a great presentation. And thank you. Yeah, there are lots. Yeah, sorry. Like I fumbled a bit. No, that's right. It's fine. Yeah. So there was a lot. Of, it's actually a chapter with a lot of material. So. Yeah, and there are lots of equations. Yeah. Yes, lots of equations. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. Sure. What's the question? I will try to understand, like, explain it as much as possible. Like, I might not be able to, but. Yeah, what's the question? You can unmute your microphone if you want. Sorry, my environment. Oh, that was why I couldn't. So, can you hear me? Hello? Can you yeah, hear I can me? hear you. Hello? Hello, I can Sorry, hear you. I said my environment is noisy. Background is, I said the background, the background of my environment is noisy. But my yeah, question but, is, yeah. I wanted to ask this question. I want to ask, I have, to, I have some questions. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. You can type your question okay. if you want in the chat window. Okay, should I type it? Yes, I think I'll be better. I think the book in general has a lot of equations. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's like a like a long term process. Like what I saw, like like if like the first time I read the read a book, like it was a like a like a was on machine learning. I did not understand most of the stuff. But when I read the second, like a, another book, it was easier to understand. So it's yeah. like, like it takes time, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Osita, are you typing your question? <laughs> uh okay so by sto stochastic process uh okay a sto stochastic process it literally uh, basically means like uh, we have like a number of random variables and we are observing a combination of those variables over different like uh, progressive time steps so yeah like there are obviously like like effect of Gaussian distribution functions were stochastic processes, but like there are some general observations and assumptions that kind of work. So one one assumption and or observation is that if we combine any random variables, then the resultant variable kind of exhibit a Gaussian distribution. So what it means like given like if we like uh, so yeah so basically that like if we we like suppose we combine uh, a number of random variables and represented it with another random variable so that random variable 
like it might be like addition of those random variables so that random variable would be uh yeah so that's the basically the question so not necessarily so this random variable each of those random variables may not be gaussian it can might have their unique distributions but if we sum them or combine them in any way then that combined variable might usually is gaussian like why is it it's pretty hard to understand but yeah that's basically their assumption Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Also, you can look into Poisson distributions if you want. Like, like the Poisson distribution is also like handles the combination of variables. Yeah, sure. That's a question. uh no i have not but like if we break the terms like i haven't exactly heard topological manifold but if we break the terms further like separately consider them so a manifold is like a like suppose we have a 3d space and we are looking into a smaller space like a 2d plane so that 2d plane would be the would be called a manifold so a topological manifold in yeah, from that point of view would be like like a topology like like the shape of the space within a bigger space so something like that but i'm not really sure i think that's what it means like okay. by manifold it means like a smaller space within a larger space okay okay well i think we're gonna wrap it up um thank you very much pinku for presenting Okay. Um, and uh, I guess we'll see everybody here uh, next week. So have a have a good night, everybody, sure. and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay.